uh, uh, show, uh, glenohumeral instability, but multidirectional instability has very uh, controversial uh, points of view and also it is uh, really a challenge for orthopedic surgeons because it's a complex condition. Uh, Erika mentioned this paper, even though the multidirectional instability or the traumatic uh, instability in fact was described initially by Hippocrates more than 25 centuries ago, uh, the first time that we have a clear um, presentation of the problem, I agree, based in a technique more than in the clinical examination or in the condition itself was by Mir and Foster uh, in the 80s. And at least this put the topic in discussion for the big audience of uh, shoulder surgeons. In the 90s, we got another uh, possibility to see the different types of instabilities, thinking about the taps and the ambry, the traumatic, the atraumatic, and fundamentally two types of patients. Uh, the patient with a normal shoulder that after a trauma developed uh, um, Inst an instability and a patient with a predisposition to uh, develop this type of instability which uh, the extreme example was the Enlerdanlos disease. Uh, the Veyton score was considered important to detect the uh, laxity and hypermobility as we all know and uh, it became very popular but uh, there were some other um, tests like the sulcus test. We can see here in, the, in this same patient, um, the thumb sign. So uh, we used to face this kind of, face of cases and uh, there were even described different tests like the, the, the uh, test described by uh, by uh, Gerber, the, that uh, it was the anterior drawer test and posterior drawer test. But we also uh, have the chance to see this type of uh, people. Uh, this was a medical student with no uh, symptoms that when I was talking about multidirectional instability, she showed me what she could do, but she had no problems with her joints. So we began to think, well, which is the threshold between the normal people and the people that have uh, problems? We know that there is a big variety of uh, levels of, uh, in, of laxity that can be uh, influenced by sex. Women generally have more laxity than men age, younger people, and even race. We, they have been shown that uh, comparing different countries, there are different levels and percentages of laxity. We also know that for some sports, uh, hyperlaxity or hypermobility is kind of an adapt adaptative reaction of the uh, joint, for instance, in swimmers or in throwers. So in these cases, could be, not be a pathology. And these papers were very interesting. One by Emery that states that general joint laxity uh, was not impor an important characteristic of patients with positive signs of instability. And on the right, you can see that the laxity, the, the magnitude of glenohumeral translation uh, is not a specific test for the diagnosis of glenohumeral instability. So as Erika said, uh, the, the use of laxity tests by themselves uh, and uh, generally lead us to an overestimation of patients suffering M MDI, but we also know that there are many patients with MDI that are not diagnosed. So we have both, uh, both extremes uh, in, the, in the daily practice. Uh, all these discussions uh, led uh, Emery to ask if MDI does really exist. And I think that a classification that gave us 
uh, much more information about this and for me it's a very interesting tool to to work with is the Tanmore classification because in this triangle made by Bailey uh, it gives us the idea that the patients are not taps or ambry but there are a lot of gray areas in which the patient can be located. And uh, we can also see that patients during the natural history of uh, their instability can move from one point to other point. There were also many years ago, uh, ideas about the rehab just thinking on the capsule and thinking about the hyperlaxity. And Rogut, that let's use this paper uh, as a, a homage to him that passed away three weeks ago, um, published with Wayne Barhead this paper uh, that I feel is a very important paper in shoulder surgery because give us the option of using rehab to treating instability and generally we surgeons we not we do not take time speaking about these topics they uh, treat a group of patients with a shoulder instability uh, with a rehab program and they realize that uh, they have good results in atraumatic instability especially in Post, posterior inferior instability, uh, better results in the absence of dislocation, uh, no difference related to age, sex, and evolution, and also report uh, bad results with traumatic instability, especially if there was trauma and dislocation. Also, surgery used to look just to the capsule and uh, techniques, the most popular techniques were inferior capsular shift, then arthroscopic placation and thermal capsular raffi, but always thinking about the capsule. But there are other structural factors that are uh, related to instability and play a role in the etiology of multidirectional instability. And we must con consider the rotator interval, the inferior labrum and the glenoid version. The, as we know, the rotator interval has a very important role in uh, inferior and posterior stabilization of the shoulder. Sometimes we found in, an insufficient in rotator interval. We make the application of the rotator interval uh, in, during the surgery, but sometimes it is even not enough. And we must go ahead with a uh, reconstruction and the coracoacromial ligament is used in some cases to reconstruct the rotator interval. As we can see in this uh, cadaver in which we perform that technique. What about the inferior labrum? We know that it has a really um, a, a lot of importance in keeping stability. It is the deeper area of the labrum and they have been described specific lesions uh, that can appear in patients with multidirectional instability, for instance, Kim lesion uh, in the posterior inferior labrum that we should consider when treating these patients. The jerk test and the Kim test are uh, good options to evaluate the posterior inferior labrum and the combination of both of them have a very high sensitivity to detect uh, posterior interior, inferior labral lesions. B what about glenoid retroversion? Well, in some patients, uh, it is important and, and it is a factor to be considered. Fortunately, it's not common, but we should also evaluate the retroversion when dealing with patients with uh, multidirectional instability. But not all are structural factors. There are also functional factors that we have underestimated for a long time. And we must consider in these patients the presence of changes in muscle activity, altered corticospinal spinal control, improper scapular positioning, and abnormal muscle recruitment. And that is a very important point because we know now that 
the neurology has a lot of importance in the uh, type of instability that these patients develop and that we will not be able to correct all the etiologic factors using the scalpel. We need to know that there is another um, area, another universe that was there for a long time and we did not recognize. That's why I think it is very important to consider the Stanmore classification because they make uh, they, a point about the polar type 3 uh, instability in, in which there is laxity, but there is also um, a alteration on the muscle patterning. And if we treat these patients as we used to treat with rehab, the type 2, just patients with laxity, may strengthening the muscles, we will just make the problem bigger. Rehab is still the first choice in patients with multidirectional instability. Uh, we stabilize the scapula, we strengthen the rotator cuff, we must treat the corticospinal dysfunction, improve proprioception, but in some patients it may be insufficient and we need to move ahead to surgery. Uh, I want to make clear that, for instance, Dr. Rogut used to treat these patients with rehab in cases of posture inferior instability uh, for one year before considering that rehab was not working because we know and we discuss this with the patient uh, at the beginning of the process of the treatment uh, that we have a long road to walk together. I want to show you a case in which this was not enough and we needed to go ahead with surgery. It was a 42 years old female uh, with a bipolar disorder treated by with lithium and this is something that is frequent um, to have some psychological uh, associated problems in some of these patients. Uh, this lady used to have several episodes of instability every day and even uh, she used to faint in the street when having uh, the instability episodes. Um, she was a single mother of a 18 month uh, old daughter so there was not just her personal problem it was a social problem uh, as well and uh, she had a long history of uh, problems with her shoulders, but no, no big problems. Till in 2002, she had a traumatic episode on, episode on her right shoulder, and she was operated with a diagnosis of acute bursitis. And uh, this is a good example of uh, how many times MDI is not recognized. And they, uh, some surgeons treat the consequence of the MDI, perhaps the most evident consequence, uh, because in many cases, instability is very subtle. But this patient keep on, uh, ha kept on having problems and uh, the shoulder was getting more and more unstable till she developed a voluntary and positional instability. When I first examined her six or seven years ago, she had on the contralateral shoulder, a very clear laxity, very clear sulcus sign. And during this first consultation, she had three episodes of dislocation, uh, just spontaneous dislocation. And uh, fortunately, she didn't faint. You can see here, uh, this was recorded by her. Uh, you can see what she can do with her shoulder and uh, she, as you see, have the chance to voluntarily dislocate her glenohumeral joint. So what to do? Well, uh, we try rehab, and I can tell you that the one who almost fainted was the physiotherapist because dealing with this lady was very difficult because of the amount of instability. Uh, the, MRI was showing um, a, a lesion, per, perhaps it was a, an, an injury of the uh, labrum. There was not 
clear. Uh, we discussed this with a very experienced uh, radiologist and was not clear if there was a lesion or not. Uh, there was a very small heel such lesion in the CT scan and no more than that. As you see, in many of these cases, the studies are almost normal. So we decided with the approval of her psychiatrist to go ahead with surgery. The diagnosis was a polar type 3 uh, instability, and we performed an arthroscopic evaluation. The labrum was intact, was no problem, was not necessary to perform nothing. Uh, we evaluate the anterior inferior labrum and the posterior inferior labrum, and then we operate in beach chair position, perform an open capsule application and closure of the rotator interval. Uh, this is the procedure that uh, Inho have shown. We uh, develop two flaps, a medial flap that goes laterally and uh, up, and a lateral flap that goes uh, medially and also goes uh, cranially or cephalic. And this was the result. Uh, fortunately, the patient, we, we get involved as surgeons in her uh, follow-up and her rehabilitation. As you can see, it's not a big incision in these uh, patients with such laxity. It is easy to get uh, even to the rotator interval uh, with that incision. And fortunately, she had seven years now of surgery. Um, is doing well. So MDI exists. It is multifactorial and we must consider not only structural changes, but also uh, functional problems. Uh, laxity by itself is not as essential as we used to think uh, many years ago. Uh, we must consider neurological disorders associated with these patients. Uh, rehab is of fundamental importance and generally is our first choice. Uh, I uh, feel very comfortable with open capsule application because the, it is a very solid construction. Uh, we overlap the, the capsule. We cut the capsule and overlap the two flaps. Uh, the posterior inferior labrum should be evaluated. And in some cases, uh, we should consider the shape of the glenoid and think if it is necessary to perform um, an osteotomy. Fortunately, I did not uh, face one of these kind of patients yet. Mm -hmm.